So, here I am, practicing this tricky pose. I must not fall over. Rosie, straighten your back. Hang in there. You've got this. That's Bradley, my yoga instructor. Can you see that? There are more than a dozen people in this class, yet he only seems to encourage me. Did this mean he liked me? I didn't need to look in a mirror to know my cheeks were lobster red right now. I'm Rosie, by the way, 18 years old. I'm still single. Not to brag, but I know I'm kind of pretty, friendly, and fun to be around. So it's easy to tell that many guys are into me. But why do none of them ever dare to confess their feelings to me? Hmm, what were they so afraid of? Take Bradley, for instance. He clearly liked me, but was too shy to admit it. It was so obvious as he kept deterring past my mat just so he could check out my position. Even my best friend Joseph noticed that. As every time Bradley approached, Joseph would have this cheeky smirk on and send me signals with his eyes. I already told him not to do that. After class, Joseph kept teasing me about it. He told me Bradley definitely had feelings for me and just needed one more push for leverage. Although I reluctantly told him to stop, he insisted on being the wingman by texting Bradley about me. Bradley, why don't you ask Rosie out? You two look really cute together. Come on, you know that wouldn't work. Huh? <laughs> why not? Because, Joseph, it's you I'm crazy about. I was not okay. What was the problem with all the men around me? Why didn't they like me? I couldn't go on like this. I must have a boyfriend. And I was dead serious about it. So after researching online, I found a dating coach to save me from my tragic single situation. So Martin, my coach, is super handsome, has a six pack, and his business is a big hit. He's helped hundreds of sad single people find love. Flashy enough to trust, isn't it? Still, I was quite nervous when I met him. You know, the feeling that a therapist would judge you before treating you. But actually, he was reassuring, very open, and didn't ask too many questions. Let's just be open about this, all right? Manipulating someone into dating you is not the foundation to a healthy relationship. But don't worry, as I have the secret. Day one. And according to Martin, I needed to learn how to approach new people. I'm pretty shy, so taking the initiative was hard for me. But Martin taught me a trick. When I see a cute guy, I need to approach him within three seconds. This way my brain wouldn't have time to think, analyze, then talk myself out of it, and end up missing my chance. Okay, a hot guy was there staring at his phone. I must not overthink. One, two, three, go. Hi! Hi? Um, so I just saw you and I think you're really hot. I'm here to say hi. Thanks for thinking my boyfriend's hot, but he's taken. I panicked, then rushed back to Martin and spluttered out, I, I, I can't. Hey, that was a success. You're just training your mind and body to take action. Go ahead. No way. Should we move to the next step? And this was the next step. I just needed to start a conversation in this place where everyone was in a mood to have a chat. It's simple, Rosie. Put yourself in a talkative mood. Go over to them and give them a compliment. But make sure it's genuine, else it won't count, okay? Got it. I spotted a man sitting alone, so I walked over to him. Hey, I like your... ring. O-M-G. Was that a wedding ring? <laughs> don't, don't worry. I'm single. And is it that hard to think of something to compliment me on? <laughs> and, um, you are smarter than you look. And yep... He left. Oh, what kind of compliment was that? Martin sat in a corner and watched me go from guy to guy and stutter out a string of terrible compliments. You did great, Rosie. Don't be discouraged. Now, when you actually see someone you like, you'll be more natural. Martin said that body language is a crucial part of keeping the conversation going. So, the plan was to practice this at Joseph's birthday party. This time, Martin couldn't be there in person, but we still stayed in touch via my Bluetooth earphones so he could guide me. The mission today was to initiate physical contact with someone and make them feel close to me. Anyone who knows me knows that I am not good with these things, so I kept giving them this weird slap on the back. Hey, I heard an ouch. Are you hitting them? I said just a light tap. I don't think I can do this. I'm too shy. And now guys are giving me weird looks. 
Martin said this time I should make the boys take the initiative, and then things would come more naturally. Okay, I'll give it one last try. This boy I like, Nathan, is over by the pool, but he's in a group. Nothing to worry about. You'll make him come to you. Now listen and follow. I walked over to the bar and made sure I was in Nathan's eyesight, sat as naturally as possible, made eye contact with him, and smiled. Oh, Martin, this is stupid. He doesn't even know me. Just wait. OMG, he's waving at me. Should I come now? No, no, no. Wave him over. Okay, you should take responsibility for this, Martin. I waved Nathan over. Then, to my surprise, he got up and started walking toward me. OMG, help, what should I do? Give a no-tooth smile. Then say, I just want to say hi. What? That was all? But he was coming closer and I had no choice. I just want to say hi. And I want to have your phone number, cutie. I couldn't believe it. That was a real success. We texted the whole night. We got on so well. He was clearly flirting with me. This is crazy. But then two weeks passed by and I didn't hear from him at all. I kept on looking at my phone expecting Nathan to call, but he never did. So I immediately rang my coach for help. Ready for the bad news? So that means he doesn't like you. A busy man like Napoleon could still write thousands of romantic love letters to his Josephine. If he was into you, he'd always find a way. And I also think he doesn't seem like a good type to date. What? Nathan is such a sweet guy. Maybe he's just super busy? But then Christmas came, and I couldn't wait any longer. I mustered up the courage to ask Nathan out. But guess what? He invited me to his house to enjoy Christmas with his family instead. Oh, wow. He wanted to introduce me to his family. This was massive. It meant he really took our relationship seriously, didn't he? But when we got to Nathan's place, to my surprise, it was just a small apartment and definitely not big enough for a whole family. Seeing my confused look, Nathan said his family must have changed their plans and went out, which was for the better as the two of us would have more time together. Suddenly, I saw a shadow of a girl in a red dress in his bedroom. Then Nathan immediately pulled me away and said, Uh, um, that's my maid. How annoying. So, do you want to go to the hotel so we can have more time alone? Really? Did he think I was born yesterday? I refused immediately, and Nathan began to change his attitude. <laughs> okay, but I can't drive you home. I have something urgent. But don't worry, I'll take you to the nearby bus stop. I have never felt so stupid. Martin was right. Nathan wasn't serious about me. He just wanted to use me. But what went wrong? I did everything I could, but I kept failing again and again. No one liked me. I called Martin in tears, and he ended up driving there to pick me up right on Christmas Eve. I felt like the most tragic person ever. Martin was so patient. He turned the radio on so loud and didn't say anything until I finished crying and calmed down. Misread the signals again, huh? How could I have known? Well, I'm not saying this to make money off you, but looking at the current situation, I think you need to hire me for longer than you think. My love life may have sucked, but at least I had Martin. Here's my hope. He was the best coach ever, as he didn't mind answering my questions, and he always picked up the phone whether it was office hours or midnight. Then one night I was out with my friends. I drank a few too many wines and phoned Martin up and slurred out a load of drunken nonsense. He immediately came to pick me up and drove me home, saying that he needed to make sure I got home safely. He was such a sweet guy. I felt something, but then reassured myself that he was just being nice. But Joseph insisted that Martin was only acting this way because he liked me. Seeing everything he did, and you still have to wonder about his feelings? Dummy. Believe me, I'm not wrong this time. Mr. Sixpack is crazy about you. Congrats. Hmm. Thinking about it, it did make sense. So I started stalking my coach on social media and daydreaming about him. Then, taking Martin's own advice that I needed to make my feelings known. So, on Valentine's night, I, myself, made this box of chocolates and took them round to his. I took a deep breath, then rang the doorbell. But then, standing at the door was him holding hands with another girl. I awkwardly said, 
don't, don't you like me? I mean, you taught me that when a guy likes a girl, he'll always be there for her. You picked me up in the middle of the night, and you always listened and comforted me when I was sad. You even brought me hot tea when my Aunt Flo came to visit. Doesn't everything match up? R Rosie, I was just being nice. Sorry, but you've confused the signs. Again. I was totally dumbfounded. I couldn't face the thought of seeing Martin ever again, so I blocked him from my life. Ugh. In the following days... I was under a variety of emotional states, from extreme stress, heartbreak, embarrassment, then disappointment because of my extra delusion. I struggled with insomnia almost every night and tried to bury my feelings by binge-eating junk food. Just two weeks later, I looked at myself in the mirror. There were dark circles under my eyes, my skin was dry and flaky, and I felt bloated and sluggish most of the time. Seeing myself like that reminded me of something Martin had said. How can you expect someone else to love you if you don't love yourself? I knew I needed to change, so I started eating more healthily, working out, and finding me time. And you know what? It worked. Now I can finally say that I see my own worth, and I'll never allow a man to treat me badly ever again. And if that means I stay single for a while, then that's the way it'll be. I guess I kinda owe Martin a lot. I mean, he did teach me loads. And now, even though I'm still single... I'm enjoying it. There are way more important things than having a boyfriend, right? But wait, was this barista winking at me? OMG, there's a post-it with his number on my coffee cup. What should I do? Hey, dating a coffee guy is risky business. Why, coach? Imagine one day your relationship turns bad and you desire a cup of coffee to ease your heart out, but you also have to see him here. Awkward, huh? Indeed a pro. But so why are you making this awkward convo? <laughs> Rosie, I may be a love coach, but even I get it wrong sometimes. When it comes to my heart, all theories are nonsense. Please, you show me how to love naturally. Um, well, as you can see, I'm dating my dating coach. But now, our love doesn't apply to any cliches. Instead, we just do us, and we're both happier than ever. If you're in a dating slump... Then don't worry. Just let love happen when it happens. And follow you. Finally, back in my natural habitat. Now these city kids could see what I'm capable of. Behold, my big, beautiful flame. They were in awe of my skill. When suddenly, the fun was put to an end by some overreacting teachers. They started yelling at me, saying there's a rule against fire. Ugh, how could you call this a campsite if campfire is not even allowed? Fire making is an essential survival skill, y'all. These boring city people don't know a thing. Who needs all their rules anyway? I know I don't. Hi, I'm Nova, the fire hazard. And I didn't always live in the city. I spent the first 14 years of my life on the road. Our family used to travel the country in our RV. We never stayed any place more than a couple of months. We foraged for food and slept under the stars. But my world was flipped upside down when my parents decided to divorce. My mom wanted to settle down and my dad would continue life on the road. I begged to go with dad, but mom had custody of me. I'd love to stay with you, my little birdie, but I have to go. No cage can hold me for too long. At that moment, I promised myself I would break free and spread my wings too. My mom and I then settled into a small two-bedroom apartment in Savannah, Georgia, where we were greeted by our neighbors, Brenda Foster, a middle school teacher, and her son, Scott, who I'd soon be attending school with. Mrs. Foster was really friendly, but from the moment I met Scott, I knew we wouldn't get along. City people were always grumpy and glued to their cell phones. Mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. Accountant by day, Burger King employee by night. Her colorful wardrobe was replaced with dull uniforms, and all we ate now was fast food. I still kept a sheer hope that one day, when Mom makes enough money, we will hit the road again soon, but... No, this is going to be our forever home. Things might be hard for you at first, but trust me, it'll be good for you in the long run. That sounds like she wants my life to be this boring and stuffy for all eternity. Then came school. There were tons of rules, and every moment of our day was scheduled. In just one morning, I got in trouble for going to the bathroom and for eating my lunch. 
And on top of that, every teacher complained about my penmanship and spelling. But things were worse when I was among other kids. I could hear their whispers everywhere I went. One girl even came up to me and asked why I wore weird hippie clothes. My clothes aren't weird, you are! Even when some of them invited me to sit with them at lunch, I felt like an outsider. Anyone down for some pink drinks after school? Not me, I'm saving up for the era's tour. Count me in! I'm entering my pink girl era! None of these words they say makes any sense to me. Finally, they asked about my old life. Well, we didn't have to eat this junk. We can get fresh vegetables by the road. And I know how to skin roadkills. And every day we tried many different fruits and fungi. But be careful, a simple mushroom could kill you. But by that point, I noticed they were either speechless or as pale as a ghost. Did I say something wrong? Every school day was a blur of confusing subjects. But today was my first music lesson, and I was so excited to finally do something I was good at. When the music teacher, Mr. Shapiro, asked if anyone wanted to perform for the class, I sprung up from my seat, ready to go. I confidently sang my favorite song, but halfway through, Mr. Shapiro interrupted me. We're learning classical music. That style is called reggae, which we don't teach here. <laughs> Nova's a hippy-dippy weirdo. The whole class erupted into laughter. What did I do? Ugh, Scott! I was so gonna give him a taste of my rosewood guitar, but everyone held me back. In the end, Mr. Shapiro said he'd be talking with our moms after school. Scott and his mom had already left before my mom came. Mr. Shapiro told her that I was a violent hothead who always dressed inappropriately. I waited for my mom to defend me, but she simply apologized. I'll talk to her about this later. Please excuse her behavior. She has never been to school before. Who was this woman and what had she done to my mother? Later, I told my mom how terrible school was. The constant staring and teasing. The way that everyone seemed to be a little afraid of me. Contrary to my expectation, she told me I should try harder to blend in. And she even had bought me normal clothes for school. Mom, clothes are my self-expression. I'm not changing just to fit in. What happened to you? Didn't you teach me to be myself? I did, but now I need you to blend in so you can make friends. I... I had to leave before bursting into tears. I couldn't stay in the stuffy apartment any longer. So I went out the window, climbed down the fire escape, and just ran away. But at one point, I realized I didn't know where to go. So I wandered around until I bumped into the Fosters, who insisted on walking me back home. Strangely, Scott seemed less annoying now, and kept looking awkwardly at me the whole way home. My mom was clearly surprised to see me when she opened the door. I felt like a joke, because she hasn't even noticed my rebellious great escape. I couldn't sleep that night. After thinking it over, I came to the conclusion that I could get my old life back if I found my dad. If only I knew how. The next morning at school, I went looking for the tools I needed to find my dad. Compass, flashlight, map. Scott? What are you up to in there? You first. I wanted to apologize for what happened in music class yesterday. Your turn. I'm gathering what I need to go find my dad, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Stop you? It looks like you need help. Those things may have helped you hundreds of years ago, but these days we just use the internet. I didn't want Scott's help, but maybe he was right. I had no clue where to start, and I could hardly even figure out how to use my cell phone. <sighs> maybe I need a little help to learn about the internet. Follow me. Scott spent that afternoon teaching me the basics of the internet. He also asked about my old life, and I found myself telling him everything. All the things I missed and hated about this new life. To my surprise, he was understanding. His mother was a single mom too, and it had been years since he heard from his father. After that day, I thought I hated him a bit less. About a week later, I felt like I was ready to start my search. Little did I know, googling my dad's name would give me literally millions of results. I was about to give up when I saw some people looking for their dogs. Hmm, that just gave me an idea. I printed as many flyers as the library would allow and spent the next day putting them up around the neighborhood. I was surprised by a strange phone number. Hello? Yeah, hi. I just saw a clueless hippie wandering around and I think they matched the description you provided. I was over the moon by how quick I got a response. But then I saw Scott, half a block away, grinning at me with a cell phone in his hand. That internet thing you taught me is useless. Finding people is not that fast, even with the internet. Your best bet would be the database at the police station. Are you sure you... I didn't need to hear any more words and immediately flagged down a police car passing by. Over here, officer! The officer pulled over and rolled down his window. Morning, sir. Please take us to the station. What are you kids doing? Where are your parents? 
Well, I'm looking for my dad. I heard the officer speak into his intercom, saying he was bringing a lost child back to the station. Well, that's not what I meant, but whatever does the job, I guess. As he led me into the back of the car, I remembered. Sir, he's with me. Should we bring him too? Correction, two lost kids. Scott was obviously stunned, as the police officer escorted us into his car. It's hilarious! <laughs> of course, I need my sidekick with me to help me find that database thingy. Shortly after arriving at the station, the officer left the room to get us some water. As soon as the door closed behind him, I sprung into action. I had to look in every corner, but Scott wasn't helping. Come help me. Where could that database thingy be in this room? What? No, dummy. It's in here. Then he jumped to the computer and did some clicking. Type your dad's name here. Keep an eye out. In an instant, a file with my dad's info came up. I printed it out and sprinted home before the ink could dry. My heart was pounding as I dialed my dad's number. Hey, yo. Dad, it's so good to hear your voice. Uh, who is this? It's me, Dad! Complete silence on the other end. Did I call the wrong number? It's me? Nova? Nova! Glad to hear from you. Guess what, kid? I've been up to all kinds of adventures. Then he talked to me about his amazing trips that I would have loved to be on. Then I asked where he was so I could go find him. I live in the moment, my little birdie. I go where the road takes me. Please, Dad, let me tag along. Okay, meet me at the exit of the interstate at 10 p.m. tomorrow. He ended the call before I could say anything else. I felt the sudden urge to cry for some reason. They must be happy tears. I was finally seeing my dad again. But how could I get there? Maybe my sidekick Scott could help me. If he had made it back from the police station. Oopsies! I ran to Scott's apartment, and to my surprise, he answered the door. Hey, how did you get home? Once I explained to the officer that you were just a little eccentric, he let me go. I'm sorry I left you there. I wasn't really thinking. Oh, I spoke to my dad, and he's picking me up tomorrow night. So, I need your help to get to the highway. The highway? What kind of parent asks his 14-year-old to meet him at the highway at night? Did he even ask you how you were doing? Or your mom? He clearly doesn't care at all. Wait, yeah, he really didn't ask. But dad probably was just busy. We can talk all about it tomorrow when we meet anyway. How dare Scott think ill of him? What do you know about my dad? He's a free spirit, and I should be traveling with him. Life's all about being spontaneous. My mom doesn't even understand it anymore, so I don't expect you to. But if you don't want to help me, fine. I'll figure it out myself. Then I stormed off. The night after, I was struggling with Google Maps. My phone was suddenly snatched out of my hand. I'll take you there. You might get lost if you go alone. I was still a little upset about yesterday, but that was nice of him. Plus, Scott was right. I would get lost on my own. We arrived early and waited. The hours dragged by, so I called Dad several times, but no answer. When I saw it was past 11 p.m., my call finally came through. Oh, man. You were there now? Our bus passed Savannah a while ago. <laughs> we're having a grand party. You should see. Oh, uh, well, maybe we'll cross paths again soon. Bye, little birdie. He hung up right away. I noticed Scott watched me for a reaction, but I couldn't hold it in and burst into tears. Scott got us on the bus to go home. I was sobbing the entire way and couldn't talk through all the tears. Eventually, Scott spoke up. When my parents divorced, I spent a lot of time being mad at my mom, too. I couldn't understand why she didn't make my dad stay. But she did try to, right? Nope. She just accepted it. And I eventually realized that she wasn't weak like I had thought. She chose to stay to make sure my life was normal. Leaving would have been easy. And what she did, keeping the lights on actually took a lot more strength. What Scott said sounded surprisingly mature. After that, we sat in silence for a while. I understood what Scott was saying, but I didn't think it applied to my case. My mom was just not the person she used to be. We arrived home very late. Before we parted, Scott said, Why don't you ask your mom why she decided to settle down here? Kids don't always understand why parents do certain things. Maybe you should hear her out. I nodded and took a deep breath before opening the door. My mom was on the phone with the cops, and as soon as she saw me, she ran to give me the biggest hug I had gotten in a long time. She asked me where I'd been, and I told her everything. How I tried to find Dad, how he stood me up, and things Scott said earlier. She listened to me attentively, then said what Dad did was terrible, but not exactly out of character. You know how we stopped by a town from time to time? Working temporary jobs like waiting tables and washing cars, right? What you didn't know is that your father always messed up and got fired a few days after he started. So he decided that he'd look after you while I worked. I didn't realize how hard mom had always been working while me and dad were just carelessly having fun. Then I asked why she chose that life in the first place. 
When I met him, I was working a 9 to 5 job that I hated. While your dad was all about, the world is a book, traveling makes you a storyteller. Of course, that sounded fascinating, so I quit my job and set myself free on the RV we bought. But why did you decide to settle down after all these years? After having you, I realized our wandering life wasn't a good environment for a kid. I was worried you'd have a hard time once you got older, especially because your dad wasn't being helpful and was only being a bad example for you. Besides, homeschooling is difficult. We aren't teachers. You deserve to grow up in a stable home, have friends your age, and create deep connections with them. I got you two, and... and people we met from all over the country. But not enough, honey. I thought I should give you a normal life while you're still young. You'll be better prepared to make your own decisions later as an adult. It was unfair to you. Because you didn't choose that life. We did. The resentment I had towards my mom melted away. In its place was a profound gratitude for all that she sacrificed. I wasn't good with words, so I told her that the best way I could. Do you miss our old life? Well, yes. But for now, you're my number one priority. After the hurt's gone, it was time to heal. I tried to focus on my lessons and learn the rules. My mom even helped me pick out clothes that were more appropriate for school, but still felt like me. I tried my best to enjoy the same movies as other kids and learn to play their favorite songs on my guitar. Soon enough, they became my new friends. I continued to grow even closer to Scott, my friend and partner in crime, from the start. Still, my mom and I agreed that we shouldn't totally abandon our love for travel, and she promised that we would plan a few big road trips every year, starting this summer. I can hardly wait for our trip to Niagara Falls with Mrs. Foster and Scott. My most precious timekeeper, there's a saying that goes, when you fully trust someone without any doubt, you'll either have a person for life or a lesson for life. You bet I learned a valuable lesson because that quote manifested itself into my life. It was the summer of 2000, before our beloved smartphones and social media even existed. Elio, Tara, and I were exploring the glorious Barcelona. Spain was our first stop on our trip across Europe to celebrate high school graduation. That's 18-year-old me. I'd always wanted a partner who I could trust with my life and stick with me through thick and thin. But the boys I dated were too childish or selfish to be considered trustworthy. Except for my sweet Elio. He's always so attentive and cared for me greatly, but somehow he couldn't ease my anxiety. At the beginning, I wanted us to have a couple's trip, but then I decided to have my only friend Tara join us, just to be safe. My treat, of course. Only Tara stayed friends with me after many other greedy leeches tried latching onto me for my family's wealth. Sure, I got you, girl. I was thinking you might just chicken out without me. Ha ha ha. She knew me too well. And so our journey began. Why Barcelona, you asked? Because I wanted to connect to my Spanish roots since my grandparents met then got married over there. Hopefully, Elio and I would be just like them. After weeks of sampling Michelin restaurants, five-star hotels, and high-end nightclubs, we visited Las Ramblas Market. And so did dozens of other tourists. Ugh, are they not seeing me intentionally? I can't suffocate between sweaty people, so I let us out of the crowd. Here comes fresh air. But hey, where are Tara and Elio? I reached for my phone and suddenly remembered that Elio had my handbag. My whole life's in there. My phone, my money, my passport. Ah, police! Officer! Officer, please help! I'm lost and I don't have my documents on me. But why did they keep dashing their gaze to me, then to each other? Oh, they understood me. Then they signaled me to follow them, probably to the police station. What? This is a hospital. They think I'm nuts? No, this isn't happening. What do I do? Uh, excuse me, you need help? That snapped me out of the panic attack. I turned around and saw two male supermodels. My, my. Hang on, time and place, Michaela. Turns out the guy who just approached me was Guzman. He's quite fluent in English and very friendly. Meanwhile, the cold one was Manu, who seemed to be watching me like an alien. I told him about my situation, then they led me to the U.S. Embassy. Luckily, they stayed to help me talk to the embassy staff, who I totally believe is the sloth from Zootopia in disguise. One eternity later, they said they'd help me find Elio and Tara, but it'd take several weeks. Ugh, that's it? What about me? I already told them I had neither money nor passport, right? Where do I stay? How would I survive? Right then, Guzman offered me to stay at his place and work at his family's restaurant in the meantime. Huh? Isn't that too generous to a stranger like me? These two beautiful and helpful people could be baits, but without any other option, I had to cautiously follow them. This was the first time I ever had to be on my own in a strange place. 
In the fact that their home was an old, slightly shabby restaurant didn't help. Mr. and Mrs. Rios, the owners, a.k.a. their parents, welcomed and fed me. I wasn't sure if the food was poisoned or not, but my rumbling tummy convinced me to blindly trust them for now. Then they showed me my room. That's nice. Perhaps a bit too nice, especially to a complete stranger. Am I going to get kidnapped like when I was five? If it wasn't for my bodyguard, I'd be living in a human trafficker's wonderland now. This room's only secured by a simple slide bolt, so I used all my strength uh, to barricade the door uh, with this wardrobe. Whew, that'll do it. I couldn't sleep much and got up pretty early, but it took me a while to remove my barricade and get downstairs. Ugh, scratch that. Or I might give myself scoliosis. At breakfast, they asked me how I was doing. I could only mutter a few Spanish phrases from school and prayed for my Spanish ancestors' assistance while their replies were too fast for me to comprehend. Besides, it sounded like they used a different language to communicate. Sensing my confusion, Guzman explained that people in Barcelona speak Catalan in their everyday life, not standard Spanish. Oh, right. Suddenly, I felt so alone among them. Unsurprisingly, when they opened, I was assigned dishwashing duty and organizing the storage room because I didn't speak any Catalan. Back home, I had maids and servants pick up after my every step. Literally. So working here was torture. Not to mention the hot weather here was draining me. My slow pace earned me Manu's glare, his annoyed frown, or sometimes a few words that I'm sure weren't very nice. Fortunately, Guzman was there to be the usual comic relief. I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. Tenada, you're doing your best, girl. Don't worry about that grumpy cat. Still, Manu was just one of my many problems. Everything seemed confusing, from how they tell the time to the metric system. Not to mention, mealtimes in Spain were always somehow two hours late. I swear, I almost blacked out from hypoglycemia the first few days. But today, Manu suddenly demanded I take a table's order. Maybe they sensed my nervousness, so they pointed at the dish they wanted from the menu. Gazpacho and pesto pasta? Got it! Call me Bear Grill. Improvise, adapt, overcome is the way to go. A while later, I was just vibing in the kitchen when I heard a commotion outside. I ran out and realized the customer from before was coughing violently. What's happening to him? I saw Mr. Rios ran up to his date, asked a few questions, and checked his half-eaten pasta. His face suddenly turned pale, and he immediately called an ambulance. Michaela, did you, by any chance, not hear that he said he had a nut allergy? Perhaps. He told me his food should be nut-free because he's allergic, but that went over my head. Thank God the ambulance arrived on time, so he was okay. Still, Mr. Rios had to apologize, and that meal was on the house. And me? Manu gave me a piece of his mind. Why is he angry at me? He knew I didn't speak their language, yet he made me take their order. I wish I spoke Catalan so I could fire him instantly. Guess I'll have to fire myself. Adios. I was walking around aimlessly when Manu and Guzman found me. They said they were looking for me everywhere. Manu's awkward expression was very unlike his usual cool appearance. Sorry, you not know Catalan, I not know English. We, um, misunderstand. Go home, please, okay? Now I knew this guy seemed cold only because he didn't speak English. Seeing their sincerity, I followed them back. But will I ever return home? What if I'll never see my friends and family again for the rest of my life? The next day, I went to the U.S. Embassy and received shocking news. Elio and Tara not only had already left Barcelona, but Spain. A week ago. Why didn't you inform me immediately when you found them? Oh, we were going to do that tomorrow. They're gone anyway. <laughs> What's so funny about that, you moron? Never mind. Burning this place down wouldn't solve anything. My world had already collapsed. What did I do to deserve this? Why am I surrounded by cruel people? My paranoia was proven right once again. I can't trust anyone but myself. I relayed the news to the Rios and asked if I could live with them longer. They reassured I could stay as long as I needed. They can't reach you now either. They couldn't have abandoned you. Maybe they were looking for a way to help you. Chin up, Queen. Your tiara's gonna fall. This family's hospitality and positive energy are unmatched. Still, it saddened me that I couldn't return home just yet. A few days later, surprisingly, Manu offered me Catalan lessons. In return, I shall teach him English. He was a natural. I, on the other hand, felt like I was born with a wrong tongue. 
Whenever Manu got mad at me for making mistakes, I'd bombard him with questions as a distraction. Why do you use Celsius and not Fahrenheit here? Why Catalan and not Spanish? And what's up with siesta? I swear, it's like the entire city suddenly drops dead in the middle of the day. At first glance, my questions seemed to annoy Manu, but he actually answered all of them. I could see his iciness slowly melting. Time passed and my Catalan improved. Today, I even chatted with Manu's parents while working. They said this restaurant was established a few generations ago, and many troubled couples stopped by this place. But love always prevails in the end because our food heals them all. Might sound romantic, but actually, that's because great-granddad liked being a love guru, while great-grandma wished to be a couples therapist. Since then, thanks to Manu and my co-workers, my life got a lot easier. Every time I messed up something, they'd offer help or guidance. One time, I got lost while delivering food and was gone for a long time. But when I got back, they didn't criticize me. One of them even joked that I didn't know the area because I rarely went out. So, Guzman suggested we three go to the beach after work. Some vitamin C sounds like what I need. Huh? But only Manu was waiting for me after our shift. It's uh, just us. Guzman's with his hot date. Guzman, you cheeky little schemer. Still, this isn't a date, right? Just two friends getting to know each other. I initially thought we're going to walk along La Rambla and arrive at Barceloneta Beach, but Manu took me to Playa Badalona, which was a bit further away, but pretty much empty and splendid. Strange how TripAdvisor didn't mention this place. Manu brought out a bottle of cava, a Barcelona specialty. Wow, isn't it expensive? Are you sure I can have this? You worked hard and deserve to play hard. Aw, so thoughtful. He might make me blush. Then we toasted to my chaotic arrival here. Mmm, that's the stuff. With Manu, I got to see an ordinary side of Barcelona. Not often do I get the chance to be somewhere this beautiful. I should be more adapting. Besides, if I wasn't here, I'd never get to observe this magnificent monument up close. Leave room for Jesus! Jesus! I mean, Guzman? He had a terrible date and came to vent. What were you thinking, Michaela? You have a boyfriend, remember? Eventually, my life here got more enjoyable. I kind of adopted the manana mentality, so taking it slow became my motto. I now realized whoever invented siesta was a genius. People would sometimes burst into songs, as others would either sing along or dance to the music. Spaniards seem to value quality of life more than those in the States. Speaking of which, I still got homesick from time to time, and Manu's the only one who seemed to notice. You can talk to me anytime. Rest assured, we're all happy to have you here. Okay, okay, I might have a teeny tiny crush on him. No, focus, Michaela. Think about Elio, your boyfriend. I wonder how he and Tara were doing. Speak of the devil, I saw them again that evening on a TV show about tourism in Marseille, France, and they shamelessly claimed to be a couple. I couldn't believe it. However, without my passport, I couldn't get to them. So I asked Manu and Guzman to go there, and they agreed. Girl, don't worry. I'm more than happy to bring those traitors to justice on your behalf. No matter what had happened, I'll be eternally grateful to them, my guardian angels. They returned after a couple of days with my stuff, but Manu said those two show no remorse as they put all the blame on me. The moment I saw them, I knew those two were backpacking. Trust me, honey, they're penniless. But I still had questions, so I immediately called Tara and chaos ensued. Tara said my paranoia and stubbornness tired her out, as they did Elio. We kept it to ourselves all this time because we didn't want to hurt you. But actually, it felt like a relief to not have you around. Did you know that we bonded over shared trauma? That's you. Good. I hope you two are happy asking strangers for money together. Tara, are you talking to Michaela? Mickey, wait. I can't listen to another word. There wasn't even any tears left in me. Manu sat down next to me. Hey, you got rid of those traitors. Why the long face? I'm fine. Don't mind me. I just lost the only two people I trust outside my family. No biggie. Come now, it's not that bad. Give up! What the? Oh, oops, my bad. Don't give up. Uh, I mean, cheer up. <laughs> Don't laugh. I mean it. Since you got here, you've become a lot more uh, independent, haven't you? You're quite a strong, resilient girl. He's right, and not just because I like him. 
I'd been so caught up in everything that I didn't realize I'd been entrusting my life to him, who I barely knew. I'd been relying so much on him and his family. Maybe it's not so bad knowing good people still exist. And this guy, he makes it so hard for me to leave this place. At the crack of dawn, I woke up to the deafening sound of helicopters? That's my family crest. My parents must have sent those choppers. A swole guy in black came up to me and said my dad wanted me home because I'd gone AWOL for far too long. Then he just grabbed me and we flew straight back to America. I begged him to turn around so I could say goodbye to Manu, Guzman, Mr. and Mrs. Rios, my saviors. But my pleading was completely ignored. I was finally home and went to college, but as a different person, I was determined to socialize more and befriend new people. And no, it's not just talks. I actually moved into the dorm to be surrounded by my peers. It's been a long time coming, but I learned to open up and keep my trust issue in check. I shouldn't pass up on companionship out of irrational fears. However, I couldn't take my mind off Manu. We didn't even properly say goodbye and had no way to contact one another. So I went back to Barcelona to look for him. But when I got there, his family said he'd just gone to the airport. Turns out, he went looking for me too. I immediately got in a taxi and headed to the airport. As soon as I arrived, I saw the earliest flight to America had already taken off. That's how my time abroad wrapped up. Michaela, mi amor, where are you? Yes, my love. That photo album again. I'm right here, eyes on me. Well, I couldn't figure out why you didn't board that flight. I just had a feeling that I'd see you again if I turned around. Call it telepathy. Hi there, I'm Maxine Coleman. I'm the only daughter of two world-famous rocket scientists. Since I was little, I was brought along each time they made a television appearance. And my plus one was always my best friend, Gail. What's your secret to such success? Well, we've both loved science since we were kids and decided to devote our lives to it. And family is our biggest motivation. It's not rocket science. Whoa, your parents are so cool. On our way home, Dad asked me, So, what's your dream, sweetie? While I was scratching my head for an answer, Gail already said, uh, I want to be a talk show host, just like the, that lady tonight. That's great. You can definitely do it. Don't worry, Maxine. You'll soon know yours. However, both Gail and I had problems learning. While Gail struggled to say a proper sentence, reading and writing gave me the hardest time. Naturally, we both hated school. My parents took me to the doctor, and I was diagnosed with dyslexia. He also said I'd have much difficulty in school and wouldn't achieve high academic results. I was quite upset to hear that, but my pop-pop, who was a high school teacher, wasn't pleased with that remark. Nonsense. Maxine's very bright. Dyslexic or not, she'll succeed with the right method. Since then, Pop-Pop began helping me and Gail study. Each time we finished a book, he'd give us little rewards. He also introduced us to sports, and even brought us to cool places like museums, galleries, and aquariums. From the moment I stepped foot in the aquarium, I knew this place is right up my alley because... Dolphins! Look, it's following me! I immediately told my parents the good news that evening. I found my passion. I'll become a marine biologist when I grow up. Years went by, and school wasn't scary to us anymore. Thanks to my pop-pop, I'm now at the top of my class and excel at biology. Dyslexia didn't have much effect on me. Meanwhile, Gail got rid of her stutter and became much more confident. We're like Superman and Batman, always side by side, working towards our own dream. Professor Coleman, please tell us more about your latest research on marine life. Ahem, this is my life's work, which has been under development for the last decade. We both got into an elite high school, which would be a good jumping pad for our future. But unlike in middle school where I could learn at my own pace, I had to bend over backwards to have a good GPA, since the curriculum here is so intense. Unfortunately, dyslexia returned due to stress, making things even harder for me. In class, I had to look up the dictionary every five minutes, which slowed me down. One time, I stayed in class during recess to correct all the D's and B's that I'd mixed up in my essay. That alone got me called nerd. On the contrary, the pretty, extroverted Gail already became the face of the student's council, and she still tried her best to help me. That's right, this is just a minor setback. But that's not all. Yesterday, my chemistry teacher asked me to read the lab safety rules. Don't taste or sniff. You should be wafting the spell. What? I mean, smell. Sorry. We're in chemistry class, not potions 101, Professor Snape. 
That's how Snape became my nickname, all because of that Robbie guy. Everyone loved his shenanigans, and he got away with everything because he's a rising track star. But really, he's the villain in my story. Lately, Gail and I had less time to chat because she's so busy, hanging out with Robbie. They met when Gail interviewed him for the school paper. Worse still, she often defended him, saying I'd like him once I got to know the guy. Ugh, no thanks. Besides, it seems that Gail's making achievements towards her dream. Meanwhile, I could barely handle studying and getting along with my classmates. Then came a time when every student who wished for a head start into a prestigious university needed to see the college counselor, Mrs. Morales. She said that my grades were pretty good, but I'd also need a good personal statement. It's supposed to capture the essence of who I am and show that I'm ready to commit myself to my future. Simple enough, right? But when it comes to actually writing, why is it so hard? Am I doubting my own plan? Can I really be a marine biologist? At dinner, I tried to bring this up to my parents, but it seemed they're already thinking I'm a marine bio student. Guess there's no turning back now. I called Gail to the aquarium to help me clear my thoughts. She was late, so I went to catch up with my dolphin friends. They actually calmed me down. Suddenly, a screeching voice took me out. You're dyslexic because you speak dolphin's language? (gasps) <gasps> Should we find Dolphinese books for you? I turned around to see Gail and an entourage of her new friends and that buffoon. They started giggling. No word in the English language could describe how mad and humiliated I was. Did you really need to bring them here just to embarrass me? I walked away, but accidentally headed to a glass tunnel. It felt like I was fully submerged underwater. The horrible memory of the time I fell through ice into the deep, dark, frozen cold water came rushing back. I immediately dashed outside. Max, wait! I turned around to see Gail running after me. Watch out! A car's coming! I quickly pushed her away. The car didn't hit her, but she's injured. We brought her to the hospital ASAP. But when she came to, Gail couldn't speak. Her doctor said her vocal cord was temporarily paralyzed due to neck and chest trauma. That meant Gail could no longer present the school sports day. I was overcome with guilt. Gail told me, I'll be alright. Sorry about earlier. I thought bringing our classmates would cheer you up. She even said that I should keep chasing my dream and not let anything hold me back. I was so touched. But somehow, her words made me feel so pressured. I'll even work harder from now on. After that day, Robbie kept following me around trying to apologize. I avoided him like the plague. One day, I even skipped English and when I got back, my classmates were buzzing about some substitute teacher named Mr. Coleman. They seemed so excited, since he didn't make them do any work and only told them fun anecdotes. Huh? That name rings a bell. And later my suspicion was confirmed, when I met with my grandpa's angry and disappointed look after school. I obviously went home to a raging storm, but it didn't matter. I used this chance to spill my guts about how exhausting school was, how annoying it was to be picked on by an absolute moron, all the time while my bestie wasn't by my side. Strangely, Grandpa listened attentively, then simply said he'd handle it. A few days later, he revealed that his way of handling it was making me that dimwit's tutor. Worst idea ever! Even though Pop Pop guaranteed that clown would work with me, I still wanted to kiss that jock with an uppercut. I ranted to Gail, thinking she'd help me out of this. Unexpectedly, Gail also told me to give him a chance. Then, I might see his good side too? Right at that moment, the idiot appeared with a Nintendo Switch. How immature! That's my cue to leave. After the first lesson, I realized any regular teaching method could never hold this dummy's attention. But I can't just give up. Pop-Pop taught me that there's no bad students. Fine, I'll find the right way to make him study. So, I showed him YouTube videos on biology to keep him focused, taught him the periodic table song, and talked about world history in his language. In 1914, after the Austrian Archduke was unrelieved, Australia-Hungary declared war on Serbia, and Russia was like, say less, we got you, bro. Then Germany wanted to be the main character and waged war when literally nobody asked. So, you're saying World War I started mostly because the German Empire was pressed about being mid? Yes, brother. After some time, Robbie's grades went from D and F to C and B. Well, I no longer had to cram like before, since preparing lessons for him helped me remember everything naturally. Studying suddenly wasn't so hard anymore. And maybe Gail was right. This guy wasn't that terrible after all. One afternoon, Robbie shared some good news. Hey, my track meet went so well. Thanks for helping me with my grades, or else I would have been disqualified. Let's celebrate! Congrats! Can't celebrate without Gail. I heard she just got back from the hospital. Let's come to her place and get nuts! Moderately, though.
Robbie passionately talked about his great achievement, while I told Gail that we're getting along now, but Gail seemed unenthusiastic. Then she coldly asked us to leave. We were both so confused. I asked Gail's mum and found out that most of her injuries had healed, except for her vocal cord. She's undergoing treatment, but her doctor was unsure how long it would take for her to talk again. Poor girl. Suddenly, Gail rushed out to put a piece of paper in my hand, then ran away. On my way home, I read the note. It's all your fault. If you didn't run, none of this would have happened. I'd rather get hit by a car. It would have only given me a broken arm. It's you who killed my dream. That's Gail's true feelings? Her words cut deep. When Gail returned to class, she didn't talk to anyone, and of course avoided me and Robbie. One time during recess, Mrs. Morales came to me and complimented my personal statement. She even said that if I kept up my GPA, I should have it all in my bag. That means my essay didn't seem as pretentious as I thought, right? Robbie was so happy for me, but I saw Gail's glare out of the corner of my eye and immediately signaled for Robbie to keep it down. At lunchtime, he asked if I was upset because of Gail. Not really. She'll perk up when she gets better. So, why the long face? Did Mrs. Morales say you have a bright future ahead of you? I'm not sure anymore. I made myself out to look like someone fully committed to marine biology in my essay, but deep down, it felt like I was lying. I can't even get close to water after... after falling through the ice that one time. I suddenly felt my throat closing and my eyes watering. I instinctively stood up and left without saying another word. I wanted to talk to my mother about this as soon as I got home, but I arrived in the middle of her conversation with Gail's mom. She brought us the good news. Voice therapy worked, and Gail could talk now. That's amazing. Gail's mom said she's waiting for me at the park, so I went straight there. At the park, I saw Gail standing by a pond. Thank goodness you can talk again. I always knew you'd recover for your dream. My dream? Tsk, <laughs> it's turned to ashes. Then Gail told me that although she could talk again, her buttery smooth voice didn't return. Oh no, I was dead inside and tried my best to comfort her. I still believed she could overcome this and regain her voice, the same way she got over her stutter. Easy for you to say. Do you know what it's like to have a demon in your throat? I don't even recognize myself anymore. No, no, you can still- How about you? Can you get over your fear to achieve your dream? Come on now, do it! With each line, Gail put another step forward, pushing me closer to the edge, until there was only a few inches between me and the water. Go on, it's for your dream. What are you afraid of? Gail took one more step, and I fell into the pond. My trauma took over me. I panicked, thinking this was it. Then someone pulled me out. Robbie! You're insane! She could have died! Gail just ran away crying. <laughs> Don't yell at her. I shouldn't have picked at her wound. Also, this should be a practice for when I become a marine biologist. Seriously? Or are you just scaring yourself even more? My family expects this much from me. If I gave up on my dream because of a tiny little accident from when I was 13, I only have myself to blame. Dream this, dream that. Are you sure that's what you really want to do, and not just a six-year-old girl's dream? Robbie's words jolted me awake. It's true that I no longer enjoy studying as much as when I was learning with Pop Pop. Every ounce of effort I put out recently was solely for a far-fetched dream that I'm not even sure if I want anymore. I don't want to disappoint my parents, but I can't keep struggling like this for the rest of my life. But I've held on to this dream for so long and worked so hard for it. What do I do if I give up now? You'll figure it out. Take your time. I used to play football and was sure that I'd become an NFL player. Then at one point I realized that's not my thing, so I quit. And after trying out many different things, I fell in love with track. Change isn't the end of the world. I can't believe it took me this long to realize that it's too early for me to commit. Change is normal. But what if I never find my life's ultimate goal? And I'm just wasting time. Jeez, chill, man. You're making someone like me, who couldn't care less about school, actually enjoy studying. You're living life and putting some good into the world. Ain't no time wasted. No need to be Martin Scorsese. <laughs> you mean marine biologist, right? <laughs> Uh, but thank you. I needed that. I came home to see Gail crying to my very concerned parents. Mom jumped to embrace me when she saw that I was drenched. Gail told me everything. Why didn't you tell us? We're so proud of you, and nothing would ever stop us. 
So Gail revealed my fear of water from that accident when I was 13, and how much I tried to overcome that fear from my childhood dream. It's so difficult for me to talk about it, mostly because I can't admit to myself that accident left a scar on me, so I'd suppressed my pain all this time. Telling both my parents about it now actually felt liberating. Luckily, they're very understanding and allowed me time to find my true calling. As for Gail, I'm sorry. I was so frustrated with myself that I put it all on you. It's not your fault. Turned out, when Gail ran off, she was hiding behind a bush nearby and overheard my conversation with Robbie. His surprisingly wise take moved her as well. Gail said she'd keep doing therapy for as long as it'd take. Yes, I believe in you. If voice therapy doesn't work out, becoming a heavy metal rock star doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> wow, really? I thought Robbie was talking for a second there. After that, it was business as usual, but there's less pressure on me. I actually made a new friend this year and got closer to my best friend. Gail's voice is improving, and she's also having fun exploring other avenues besides talk show host now. Summer came in the blink of an eye, and I decided to volunteer at a school for students with learning disabilities. I wanted to help other dyslexic people like me learn to the best of their ability, the same way Pop Pop helped me. It sounds like a good start for my own self-discovery journey. That could be my dream job. If it's not, I'll keep looking. It was the princess fair today at my school. Each girl would show up with a parent, both dressed in princess costumes. My dad and I were anxiously waiting when the teacher finally called our names. But when we showed up on stage, there was a brief moment of silence. Then the whole crowd fell into chaos. Um, my dad in a princess dress doesn't seem too friendly, huh? Hi there, my name's Pamela. Are you wondering how we ended up in that situation? Stay tuned, because I'm about to tell you the funniest story ever. I grew up with two loving parents. Mom ran a popular pizzeria in town, while Dad was a professional boxer. But then, Mom passed away in an accident, while Dad was away on a tournament. After that, Dad couldn't stop grieving and blamed himself for leaving Mom alone. So he decided to quit boxing to take care of me and the pizzeria. Growing up, Dad would always make sure I didn't miss out on being a girl, but somehow he failed every single time. It's a miracle. Like, when he tried to do my ponytail, he struggled so much I thought he was boxing with my hair. Today was just one of Dad's failed attempts. After the show, we were heading out when we came across Mr. Rocky, Dad's former competitor. Oh, isn't it Mr. Barkley, our boxing champ? Hi, Rocky. We couldn't believe it when you left the ring. You were a legend, Barkley. But I guess family first, right? Once a famous boxer, now a princess dad? <laughs> Oh, by the way, this is my son. He's gonna be following in my footsteps. Warrior blood runs in the family, you know? Hope it doesn't run in the family to be a jerk like you. When we were home, I saw Dad ruminating, probably thinking about the encounter with Rocky. So I lied to him. Dad, I know you've been doing this for me, but all these girly things are not for me anyway. Instead, could you teach me boxing? I want to be a boxer like you. Honest to God, I still love being girly and all, but just seeing how happy he was, I knew I had made the right choice. From then on, I grew up helping Dad run the pizzeria and learn boxing with him. Eventually, Dad got more students. Carson is the oldest and Dad's favorite. He also came to live with us and help with the restaurant. Business soon started picking up thanks to my boxing bros. The customers, especially females, love them. Soon, we became the hottest pizzeria in town. One time, while running errands for the restaurant, we heard an old lady yelling at someone. You're stealing my cookies, young man! But the guy just walked away, leaving the hopeless lady behind. The audacity of him! I immediately charged at him and tackled him to the ground. Didn't you hear, you thief? Return her cookies now! Hey, stop! It's a misunderstanding. I saw her putting the cookies in her bag already. The old lady immediately checked her bag and her cookies were indeed inside. I awkwardly released the guy, and once he turned around, I was shocked. He looks like an angel walking on earth, even with that annoyed look he was throwing at me. Is this love at first sight? <sighs> on my way home, I couldn't stop dreaming about him, when suddenly, I noticed a moving truck parked at the building next door, and right there was him. He was sweating profoundly, then suddenly took off his shirt, revealing his six-pack. Whoa, it's my lucky day. Later, I asked around and learned that his name is Denzel, and he just moved here with his mother, Michelle. From then on, I couldn't focus on anything else, as pretty boy Denzel and his heavenly abs kept running through my head. Hey, what's up? Ah, what's wrong with you? Oops, sorry. It's just that I think I have a major crush on our new neighbor, Denzel. What? For real? Yeah, but I don't know what to do. 
Got any advice? Hmm, I got plenty, but... Oh, come on! I'll do anything! Please? Okay, okay. Now listen carefully. According to Carson, the best way to show my charm is by flexing my muscles? So I set up this new punching bag right in front of the house, waited for him to show up, and used all my might to pound on the thing. Ha! 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 But Denzel was so unimpressed. He just coldly tossed the garbage, then slammed the door shut. Later, I waited till Denzel appeared by his window, then started lifting my desk up with one hand to impress him. Evening yoga! Ha! <laughs> He looked at me as if I was some circus clown and shut the blinds. <sighs> Bummed out, the next day I went to talk to Carson. Nothing I try works. He just doesn't care. You sure? It worked every time I wanted to get girls. But I'm a girl. <sighs> Ugh, you're messing with me, aren't you? Gotcha. <laughs> but what's so interesting about him anyway? You could be with me instead. I can treat you better, Pam. You're just like a brother to me, Carson. Thanks for your help, by the way. So much for counting on him. But that's not all. The next day, I already caught sight of Carson and the gang cornering Denzel. I immediately dashed in to protect him. Relax, we're not doing anything. It's just that Denzel wanted this bag for his mommy, but I wanted it for you. How about a fistfight to settle this? Whoever wins gets it? Only fair, right? I got dibs on it, so I see no reason to fight. But if you insist, you can have it. Stop pretending to be so generous. Just say you're scared, wimp. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I don't like fighting. Then he calmly walked away. I caught up with him around the corner. Hey, don't worry. I got your back. Carson wouldn't be able to touch you. No need. You don't think I can protect you? I'm a boxer, just so you know. Uh, ha, ah. You know what I hate the most in this world? Boxers. And by the way, could you move your punching bag elsewhere? It frustrates me every time I see it. So all my efforts to charm him are for nothing? And what does he have against boxing anyway? The next couple days, I arrived home from school to see what seemed like a heated argument between Dad and Denzel's mom, Michelle. I came to ask what was happening, and turned out Michelle just opened up a new pizzeria right around the corner from my family's. Now she's officially competing with us. I lost my job in the city, and making pizza is the only job I've ever had. But why in this town? Why so close to our restaurant? We actually inherited the land from Denzo's grandmother, and I can't afford to move anywhere else. But trust me, I didn't mean to compete with your dad. <sighs> I see. Why don't you come over for cookies? Denzel told me you're in the same class with him, right? Denzel mentioned me? Hmm, it sure feels awkward with Michelle, but if I could be close to Denzel again, why not? Once inside, I was immediately impressed with a house taken care of by a woman's hand. It's a small space, but felt so cozy. Everything was so organized. And look at all these high heels. Wow! Pamela, I just noticed your hair is so beautiful. Can I style it? R really? Uh, please do! Dad used to make me wear a beanie all the time because he always messed up my hair. It feels so nice being a girl again. I got home thinking Michelle was pretty nice, and she reminded me of Mom. So I explained to Dad, trying to calm him down. But once Carson whispered something to him, he immediately decided to declare war on Michelle. Ironically, Michelle's pizzeria soon attracted all the customers, since Denzel in a waiter outfit is on the next level. Carson and Dad were furious, and they decided to pull pranks on them, starting with the restaurant's sign. Then they spread rumors online that Michelle didn't wash her hands after using the bathroom and went straight into kneading the dough. Carson even planned with Dad to sneak a rat into Michelle's pizzeria to scare the customers away, but I informed her just in time so she successfully avoided harm. Meanwhile, the more I hung out with Michelle, the closer we got. We went shopping together, recreated all my favorite dishes Mom used to make, and she even taught me how to do makeup. Pamela is so pretty, right Denzo? Was I hallucinating, or did he just blush? One day I came over to Michelle's restaurant after class, but it wasn't as busy as usual, and Michelle seemed so depressed. Someone pretended to be me and posted nasty reviews online for your dad's restaurant, and townspeople thought it was me. They decided to cancel on me and call me out for using unfair practices, but I swear I had nothing to do with it. Feeling uneasy, I ran home to confront Dad. But when I arrived, I saw a sprinting figure in black running away from Carson and Dad. You thief! Stop right there! Suddenly, Denzel appeared where the thief was heading. He immediately held Denzel hostage. Take him down! But Denzel just stood there frozen. Right then, a motorbike rushed over. The thief quickly pushed Denzel away, jumped onto the bike and got away. I rushed to check on Denzel, but he seemed annoyed and left. We could have captured the thief. What a coward. 
Denzel froze at those words, but then let go and walked away. Later, I was glad to know the thief didn't steal anything from my house, but Carson started trash-talking Denzel again. Mr. Barkley, I think Denzel was behind the theft. That was probably why you let them go. Quit it already. Why do you have to be so suspicious and hateful? Oh yeah? What about you? Have fun snitching on our plan to Michelle? What? You've been telling them our plans? I did. So what? Since when did you become so petty, Dad? And the whole fake review kerfuffle? It was you who pretended to be Michelle and gave our restaurant bad reviews. So she got cancelled, right? Dad didn't say a word when Carson jumped in. You got any proof? Just as I thought. While you were hanging out with those suckers, Mr. Barkley and I did some digging and found out Denzel was Rocky's son, his worst enemy. Huh, <laughs> can't imagine the boxer's son being such a wimp. Stop calling him a wimp! That's enough. Pamela, you have one choice. Stop hanging out with Michelle and that wimpy kid. I will never accept that kind of man. Too frustrated, I just stormed out of there and went straight to Michelle's. I then unloaded everything to her, and she invited me to stay over till Dad calmed down. Thinking about what Carson said earlier, I asked, So, is Denzel's dad Mr. Rocky, the boxer? Yes, he is. <sighs> but we got divorced a long time ago. Denzel's been staying with me since. It suddenly turned awkward and heavy. Denzel just stood up and left. <sighs> it's just that Denzel doesn't like talking about his dad. Anyway, I'm gonna head to bed. Make yourself at home, okay? I then joined Denzel when he suddenly spoke up. You know why I didn't fight back? That day with Carson at the mall, or even today? You probably think I'm a coward, too. No, that's not what I think of you. <sighs> when I was a kid, I used to admire him and even dreamed of becoming a boxer just like him. But then that same man, outside the boxing ring, became a monster to my mom. I put him up on a pedestal, but he made her life miserable. So I swore to myself to never use violence and stopped boxing. So that was why he thought the sport itself made people become violent? Surprisingly, after the roof talk, Denzel seemed less distant and even waited for me after class. It was still a little awkward, but just being this close to him was enough to make my heart join Formula One. However, Carson wouldn't stop being an annoying third wheel. Legend, oh legend, the third wheel legend, always in the way. He followed us everywhere and people started calling us the Three Musketeers. Ugh. Meanwhile, the pranks from Carson and Dad were getting more and more serious. Michelle's supply trucks were constantly tampered with and lost all of their ingredients on the way. Michelle was distraught while Denzel was furious and suggested he go get the ingredients himself. I had enough. So that afternoon when Dad was still busy at the restaurant, I confronted Carson. It was you all along, wasn't it? Dad couldn't do all that single-handedly. Thanks to you, Denzel will have to carry the supply himself tonight. Always Denzel, Denzel. Could our conversation be less about that coward and more about you and me? Then maybe I could convince Mr. Barkley to stop. In your wildest dream, even if you were the only man left on Earth, I'd rather go extinct than date you. There, that should knock some senses into him. But later that day, I got a text from Carson. If you want to know who's responsible for the sabotage, come to the junkyard. Oh, by the way, Denzel's gonna drive past too, right? Shipping the ingredients and all. What is he up to? I texted Dad to come with as this could show him Carson's real face. Then I ran to the junkyard. I arrived to see Carson standing there all by himself. You were right. It was me all along who faked Michelle's reviews and sabotaged her supply trucks. I tried so hard to get you, but you only had eyes for that stupid Denzel. But in just a moment, you'll see you picked the wrong guy. W what are you doing? He tied me to a car despite my efforts to get free, then went to set up what seemed like a trap. Just then I saw Denzel, carrying goods on a scooter, about to come through. No! Denzel! Don't! He drove straight into the trap, lost control, and fell over. Oh, boo-hoo! Did it hurt? Too bad. You and I are gonna fight right here, right now. Whoever wins can have Pamela. I already told you, I don't fight. See, Pamela? He's not interested. <laughs> You're willing to go this far to prove a point? You know what? Challenge accepted. Oh, no, no, no. He just fell and looked like he'd hurt his leg. Carson immediately out Denzel easily. I was screaming when someone appeared next to me. Dad! Shh. Let's just see. A true boxing spirit will not back down easily. Just then, we saw Denzel slowly rise up and suddenly gave Carson a knockout. Holy camoly! Where did that sudden burst of power come from? I immediately rushed to check on Denzel while Dad went to Carson. I trusted you, but you dared to do all the dirty deeds behind my back. You don't deserve to be a true boxer. Get out of my sight for good. Now. Who's the coward now, huh? You said you'd never fight. 
My dad makes me think boxing is violent and violence is bad, but it's not. Abusing violence is. It's okay to fight for justice. In this case, fighting for the people I love. Sorry, Denzel. I was wrong for judging you too quickly. You're not a coward at all. That's right. A man's bravery doesn't just come from his brawn or belligerence, but should come from his spirit. Huh. Did I say something wrong? Wow. Never thought you could be this mature. <laughs> My dad then went and apologized to Michelle for hurting her business, and suggested they join forces together and open up a new pizzeria. Fortunately, Michelle was cool and agreed. After that, Denzel decided to get back to boxing. And best of all, my dad is teaching us both. Okay, you two can practice now. I gotta go over to the restaurant to help Michelle. And you know what else? Denzel and I are finally dating! Ouch, it hurts so bad. Oh, I'm sorry, are you- You and your silly antics. It does hurt. I'm not joking. Does this help then? Annyeonghaseyo. I'm Minzi from Seoul. Do you believe conspiracy theories are real? Because I do. Before I tell you my paranormal story, please like and subscribe. Nothing much to say about myself. I'm timid, introverted, but above all, I have a big ambition to webtoon horror category. Ahem. It's one of a kind, right? I've spent sleepless nights on that. Go kneel in the hallway for 30 minutes. Now. Aw, oh, man. Creepy Mincy is at it again. She wants to haunt the whole class with those ugly doodles or something? Ugly? Well, not as ugly as your... your grandmother. The whole class gasped at my insensitive words. But it's that girl. Supin's fault first. No matter how invested I was into my draft, it only ended up another chance for Supin and her posse to laugh at me. And well, thanks to my poor communication skills, no one wants to be my friend. Well, except Hajun, my childhood friend. He's always been so nice to me, not to mention he's handsome, friendly, and smart. You could tell I had a crush on him, right? But of course, I have no guts to tell him. <sighs> One day I was riding my bike around when I suddenly saw flyers from Blackwood Publishing, the biggest publisher on Webtoon. They're looking for a comic collaborator. Oh, wow. I could send mine to them. But would I stand a chance? I bet the candidates are way more talented than me. As, I guess I better stop dreaming. Just then a skater kid dashed towards me. I managed to dodge him, but ended up crashing onto the pavement fence. I felt myself flip through the air, and then everything went black. When I opened my eyes, I found myself on the hospital bed. Mom and Dad were beside me. They looked like they couldn't believe it, then burst into tears. Mincy, honey, you're finally awake. Thank God. You've been in a coma for the whole month. We were worried sick. Hold on a sec. A whole month in a coma? Was I that seriously injured? It took me a few days to recover and process all of this before going back to school. Bet these kids didn't even notice I was missing class for a month, though. But suddenly, someone sprung on my back. Supin? Oh, here you are, Urichingu! Let's go shopping today! The dress you picked me last time was perfect for my date! W what dress? Am I friends with these mean girls now? And not just them. Everyone else seemed to be friendly to me all of a sudden. They gave me cookies, carried my food tray, and even lent me their notebooks. It's weird, but kind of nice, though. <laughs> Except the only person I cared about just straight up ignored me. Hey, Hajun, wait up. Are you all right? I'm fine. It's none of your concern anyway. Oh, I just want to check in on you. <sighs> Could today get any weirder? Yes, it did. When I came home, I suddenly received an email from Blackwood Publishing. Congratulations! Your digital comic is now officially published on our website. To celebrate your success, please come to our office tomorrow. Huh? Is this a prank? I quickly checked, and it's not. My comics were literally on the headliner. But how? I mustered all the courage and went to the publisher. One step in, and I was overwhelmed by all the facilities. It was all so new to me. But just then, a group of people flocked around me and babbled to me nonstop, like they'd known me before. Yeah, our faith boy group BOF, Boys Over Flowers, is holding a concert tonight. Those opas make my emo heartbeat like crazy. Hey, you should come with us. It's gonna be so much fun. Eek! Oh, but didn't those boys only lip sync and dance half-heartedly? I even heard people say it's a waste of money going to their concert. Guys, did I say something wrong? Suddenly, I got this chill down my spine. Someone's hands were crawling around my waist. My boo-boo's here. Ah, pervert! I turned around and slapped him in the face. Oh, why did you do that? It's me who should ask this. Why did you touch me? Are you serious? Wait, are you still sulking with me? What? I'm sorry, okay? Now your boyfriend's ready for some snuggles. 
boyfriend? Last time I checked, I still had the biggest crush on Hajun. How did I settle for this dandy? The guy was extremely clingy. He wouldn't leave me alone for a sec. Um, don't you have any work to do? Work? I am. I'm tending to the artwork of my life. You! <laughs> uh, sure. He also kept insisting on seeing my webtoon draft to help me polish it. Help my butt? He only messed it all up. Not to mention, everything is completely new to me, but everyone acted like I'm so used to all of this. This didn't feel right. Later the day I told my parents about this, and they said the doctor did mention possible memory loss due to brain injury. Hmm, makes sense. But why did they seem all anxious? Over the next few days, I tried to cope with my new life, even though it didn't make any sense at all. Like, I now had my favorite seat in the canteen. You nerds are sitting on Minzy's spot. Move! And apparently, I got a new hobby of skipping school now. What's the matter? You've done this so many times before. <laughs> Why did I even do this? Hajun, on the other hand, still kept distance from me. Until today, we had a project discussion. I tried to break the ice, but he only replied coldly. Why are you here? This whole month you've ditched me to hang out with your hot friends, and now you suddenly want to talk to me again? The, the whole month? What do you mean? You suddenly turned 180 degrees and became this attention seeker. You even pulled stupid pranks on those mean girls and got them to worship you as their leader. B but I was in a coma the whole month. <laughs> You're kidding, right? No, why would I joke about something like that? Then who was the Mincy I saw every day at school the past month? Was he saying I was in two places at once? How was that possible? Hajun came up with a bunch of conspiracy theories, then concluded that I had an imposter, and she had been replacing me while I was in the hospital. It made perfect sense, but so bizarre at the same time. Seeing how freaked out I was, Hajun gently comforted me, saying he'd help me figure this out. I knew it. He still cared about me deep down. While we were discussing, Su Pin and her clique came interrupting us. Hey, Mincy! What are you doing with this geek? Remember our group meetup today with the Ansan Highs boys? Meet up? Uh, no, I don't think I can- Of course she remembers. Can I come too? I'll keep my mouth zipped. Fine! Now hurry up! Psst, what are you up to? Your imposters must have known about this meetup, so she might be there. This is our chance to catch her. Except, the imposter was nowhere to be found, while I was stuck with these self-obsessed dudes. Where's your sass, Mincy? Introduce yourself! Oh, um, hi. Uh, I'm Mincy. You can call me Sugar Mincy. Because I'm sweet as pie and you sure want to take a, a bite. The whole room was dead silence. <laughs> Girl, you got no riz. Wonder why you can't date anyone. Everyone was laughing at my face. Luckily, Hajun grabbed my hand and took me out of there. Here's much better. But I couldn't help but thinking how my life had turned upside down because of that imposter. You all right? You don't have to force yourself into a mold that isn't for you. You're special for who you are. And I prefer this you rather than that imposter. I could feel something churning in my stomach. I'm so glad I always have him by my side. The next morning, Su Pin and her clique suddenly came to apologize for laughing at me. But why? Uh, didn't you come back last night and snapped at us? Told us to publicly apologize to you today? I did? So the copycat did come to the karaoke. Did she intentionally stalk me? Later that day, I went to tell Hajun about this. But why did she have to do that? I mean, she tried to stand up for you, right? I don't know. It must be part of her scheme or something. I have to find her ASAP. Suddenly, I got the notification of the Mean Girls live streaming at a cafe. Wow, guess who it is, guys? Oh, our little rich lady is a waitress. And she dared to look down on us all the time. She steered her cam towards the poor girl they were talking about. And she looked exactly like me. It's her! Hajun and I immediately rushed to the cafe and saw Su Pin and the imposter was about to jump at each other. What's going on here? Mincy? Wh what? Why are there two Mincy's? <laughs> it's a g g g ghost! Guys, run! You! Who are you? And why did you pretend to be me, you imposter? Mincy, finally we meet. I'm your twin sister. Minha! S sister We're related? But mom and dad never told me I had a long-lost sister. Because you're adopted. They didn't know you had a twin sister who just got adopted before you. You're lying. I'm not. I didn't know this either until my mom was in her final moments. Mom had been sick for a while. So one day she called me to her bed, told me the truth before she drew her last breath. After that, I came to find you. But you were already in the hospital by then. You did wake up after surgery. But once you saw me, 
you immediately had a seizure and fell back into a coma again. Your parents and I agreed it was best for you if I stayed away and waited until you fully recovered. Meanwhile, you decided to live my life for me? Believe it or not, I actually wanted to know what my long-lost twin sister's like. How she's doing? Turns out you're a very talented comic artist, but you're always so insecure. And you're not doing well with the kids at school either. So I wanted to help you out. Sending your webtoon draft, working at the publisher, and fixing those mean girls' wagons. I just went with it and ended up getting too wrapped up. Really, did you get wrapped up in dating a random guy under my name too? And what about school? Did my parents agree to let you replace me? It was my idea and I persuaded them. They're just worried about you. I didn't ask for any of these in the first place. Thanks to you, I've become a stranger to my own life. You're happy now? Then I ran away, never wanting to see her again. Still, the worst part was, my parents lied to me. Why did you do it? You didn't tell me I'm adopted, and now you let a stranger replace me? Do you really see me as your child? Minty, honey, of course you're our daughter. Nothing could ever change that. We were afraid you'd be sad if you knew you were adopted. Truthfully, we love you more than you can ever imagine. It's a lot to process, but I had to be strong and stay focused. But soon, whisperings caught my ears. Did you notice Mincy recently is different and even a little bit dull? Where's the cheeky Mincy we're used to? Hey, do you get that bad vibe from Mincy lately? Somehow she'd gone back to being a sullen, creepy nerd again. God, why did everyone keep comparing me to that imposter? Hey, you all right? No, I'm not. Everyone seemed to like Minha and she'd only been here for a month. But nobody cared about me. I do care about you. You always got me. Your handsome friend, ready to the rescue. <laughs> Whatever you say. Come to think of it, your sister only meant well. Despite her way, all she wants is to help you to be more open and show your hidden talents to the world. What Hajun said got me thinking that night. Maybe he's right. If it hadn't been for her, my webtoon would have been forever locked in my iPad. Besides, she's only got me as a family. I've got to see her now. Hey, I came to apologize. I could see you only meant well. And I was only acting ungrateful. I'm sorry. And also, thank you, Uni. There's nothing to be sorry about. It's my fault too for acting on my own and getting myself to fall in love with Si Wu. I haven't told him yet, but I will find the chance. Sorry for dragging you into my stuff. I leapt into her embrace and felt the happy tears running down my cheeks. After the teary reunion, we spent hours catching up with each other. It's like we're reading each other's minds. Must be the twin bond. <laughs> I even invited her to my house and we had a good time. For the next couple days, I only focused on the webtoon and getting to know myself better. With Hajun's help, I now felt more comfortable and confident speaking with others. One day at the publisher, while I was having a little chit-chat break, a colleague rushed in. Minzi, Minzi, did you hear the news? Your webtoon won the first prize of Comic Award. Comic? The most renowned award in webtoon? Oh my god, I'm dreaming, right? My hard work finally bore fruits. I was celebrating with my colleague when out of nowhere, Si Wu dragged me out. You better announce me as the co-author. I helped you with the sketches, the script, the coloring, yada yada yada, remember? What? You were only messing it up. Do you even know what the story is about? Babe, don't challenge me. Or else, I would tell the director, aka my dad, to kick you out. And by the way, let's break up. Excuse me? You really think I like you? Oh, please. I only do it for your webtoon, babe. Grr, that dandy jerk. I knew he was no good. But what could I do now? Later, I told Minha everything, and she was heartbroken and begged me to help her sneak into Siwoo's office. So I did. Siwoo, please don't leave me. How could I live without you? Oh, it'll be hard, because I'm irresistible. <laughs> but you gotta let go, babe. You have nothing else to offer me. I already know you don't love me, but I do love you. And I already put a love spell on you. You'll forever be haunted by me. <laughs> then, Minha fainted, crashed on the floor. Scaredy cat Siwoo was freaking out. Hey, hey, you're not gone, right? Suddenly, the light turned off. What in the Holy Spirit's going on? The light turned on again, and the guy stopped screaming until he saw me. Hi, babe. Ah, what? Why are, what are you? You don't recognize me. It's me, Minji, in spirit form. Stay the heck away from me. After every despicable thing you've done to me. Please, please. Come with me, you crooked. To, to, where? To the other side! He was so scared his eyes went white. 
Then he fainted. <laughs> Serves you right. And let me introduce my Ekip with Minha, who should win Oscars for that performance, and Ha Jun, who's behind the light effect. Didn't think of that, did you? After that, Siwoo kept insisting I was some spiritual force that haunted this place. Then eventually, he quit the job. And of course, I had the full copyright of my webtoon and was eligible to receive the comic award. My career has just begun as I decided to continue to work at Blackwood. Mom and Dad also decided to adopt Minha into our family, and we could finally be together. That's the magic I wanted to tell you. This unexpected event changed my life for the better. Chance doesn't come twice, right? You have to grasp it. By the way, I want to ask, do you guys have any unexpected events that changed your entire life? Tell us in the comments below. Hang on, here's one more thing I have to do for the old shy me. Hajun, uh, I've been wanting to tell you something. The past event got me thinking, if I don't start telling you how I feel now, I might regret it later. So, Kim Hajun, I like you. So, so much. Finally, it took you that long. When you were in hospital, you weren't the Minzi I knew, which freaked me out thinking what if I couldn't see the real you anymore. It's comforting that you're still here, because I got a huge crush on you too. I was tidying up my room when a call came through. Oh, my big sister! She lives with mom, so I've not seen her in a year. Blair! It's been a hot minute. How have you been? Hi, Karenin. Well, not so good. Mom left. Oh no! What happened? Then Blair told me it's due to mom's debts. She had run away from the loan sharks and left my sister behind. That's awful! So I told her to come to Portland and live with us. She agreed to come, but then I realized that Blair staying here wasn't really down to me. Oh well, it's not like I could leave her in danger, right? So, later over dinner, I told my family about Blair's current situation. Oh, how terrible! Yes, Blair must come and stay. Yay! Their kindness didn't surprise me as my stepmom and stepsis, Chrissy, have been lovely to me ever since I moved in. You know what's even cooler? Christy is a rising teen pop star, but she's so sweet. We've grown super close, and she even told me all about her secret boyfriend, Damien. They'd been together long before Chrissy became famous, and had since kept their relationship out of the public eye. This is so exciting! I haven't seen Blair since our parents split. This guest bedroom is going to be hers, and we're living under one roof again. Blair's basically my alter ego. She's pretty, outgoing, and popular, while I'm more of a homebody. Come to think of it, I see a lot of Blair and Chrissy. They're both so extroverted and confident. They'll get along just great. But to everyone's surprise, Blair showed up looking completely different. Wow, it seems like living with Mom, a party animal, had clearly influenced Blair. Hello, Blair. I'm Stacy, and this is my daughter Chrissy. Welcome to Portland. You must be tired from your trip. Let me take your bag. Sure. Huh? Doesn't it seem like everyone's excited about Blair's arrival, all except for Blair? Maybe she's just tired. I showed Blair her room and helped her unpack. Oh my god, they're unbearable. How can you stand living with them? They think they're so much better than everyone else. What? Blair had only spoken to them for five seconds. Why she disliked them so much already? Give them a chance, they're really lovely. Blair's probably just stressed out from all the mom stuff. Hopefully with time, she'll see how great stepmom and Chrissy are. Only things didn't get any better. After class, both Chrissy and Blair came up to me. Hey, hey wanna, wanna hang, hang out? out? I asked her first. Oh, then we can all go together. Sorry, Chrissy. It's just that we haven't seen each other in ages, and there's a lot of catching up to do. Maybe we can go to Sephora tomorrow to check out that new Anastasia palette you like. Sure, have fun. Then Chrissy left. I'm sure she really wants us all to hang out. Oh, please. She thinks just because she's popular, she can always get her own way. She's mid. Okay, maybe it's best not to mention either of my sisters to one another to avoid World War III. Things went on like that for a while. I took turns to hang out with Blair and Chrissy. Once when Blair was chilling in my room, I noticed her smiling at her phone. Seemed like our homegirl had finally found something fun to enjoy around here. I excitedly asked her what she was watching. Look, isn't he cute? He goes to our school also. Wait. No, it can't be. That's Damien, Chrissy's secret boyfriend. If Blair learns that the girl she hates is her crush's girlfriend, all hell will break loose. I think I'll ask him out. Really? He's so popular, he must have hundreds of girls wrapped around his finger already. Besides, what if he's not into you? You'll only be rejected and get hurt. What do you mean? Am I not pretty enough? 
Oh, I see. You think that a popular guy like him is only suitable for your famous, fabulous other sister, Chrissy, don't you? No, no, that's not what I mean. You're gorgeous. In fact, out of his league. You deserve a guy who has time just for you. So why bother competing for attention from someone like him? Okay, thanks. But he's my type. I'll ask for his number Monday morning. Oh no, I just accidentally encouraged Blair to ask out Chrissy's boyfriend. I can't reveal that Chrissy and Damien are secretly together, but I can't let Blair steal someone else's boyfriend either. What a mess. I tossed and turned all night. Then when I woke up, I decided I'd just have to make Blair stop liking Damien. I don't condone catfishing, but right now it's the only way. Hey there, Blair, right? It's Damien here from math class. What you doing? A few seconds later, Blair replied, Oh my god, I was just thinking about getting your number. Looks like the first steps of my plan are working. I texted Blair as Damien regularly. I made sure he was a man of a thousand red flags. But for some puzzling reason, Blair seemed smitten with him. I gave him a seriously challengeable temperament. He could throw a tantrum one moment and become sweet the next. Then I photoshopped Damien's selfie into a photo of a messy bedroom, then sent it to Blair. Surely she couldn't abide by a narcissistic, messy guy like him. I'm so sorry, Damien, but I have to save my family. Huh? What? She sent back a picture of her room being messier than ever. She's always the clean freak around here. I had to see with my own eyes. H hey, may I borrow your hair curler? And what's with your room? So what if it's a bit untidy? Neat people are total psychos. Okay, it's time to get personal. Blair's biggest pet peeve was being commented on her look. So when she sent Damien a selfie, I didn't hold back. Babe, can't you dress more ladylike? And you really should cover up that awful tattoo. Voila, that's how you wake up the beast inside this fierce girl. <laughs> However, the next day, Blair showed up with a completely new look. Worse still, she walked straight over to Damien. I had to fake having an emergency to prevent a disaster from happening. Afterward, I texted Blair. I'm not ready to let everyone know about us yet. Please understand, babe. You know I like you. There, that should stop her from trying to approach him again. Even so, during lunch, Blair wouldn't stop blabbering about Damien and showing me his texts. Isn't he quite rude? You don't normally let guys tell you what to do. He's not. He's just opinionated. I'm into that. No, he's horrible. I don't understand why you like him. He's sweet. You just don't know him like I do. Our love is complicated, but that's what makes it special. Seriously, you called that love? What do you know? Okay, little Miss Love Guru, if you're really that experienced, make that guy your boyfriend. Succeed, and I'll give out the love of my life. If not, I'll do as I please. What Blair is daring me to do was impossible. That guy, Adrian, is as popular as Damien. While Damien's the friendly one, Adrian is nicknamed Jack Frost due to his icy cold exterior. Rumor has it, no one has ever seen him crack a smile. Surrender, as expected. Then step aside, sister. Not knowing what else to do, I agreed to the bet. This is for Blair, for Chrissy, for Dad's happiness. H Hi, Adrian, right? I, I, I'm, uh, are you free tonight? Or whenever. He gave me this cold glance, then went back to chatting with Damien. Please, I'm just trying to win a bet with my sister. One smile from you is enough to save the fate of an entire family and stop two girls becoming homeless. Can you just- Adrian gave me this odd look. Then he burst out laughing and took my hand. Sure thing. Can't wait for our date tonight. I left in a haze of confusion. That really just happened? Adrian must be messing around. But nope. He actually showed up at my doorstep that evening. This meant I'd won the bet, right? So I called Blair over to show her, but she just brushed it off. That proves nothing. Talk to me when Ice Boy professes his love for you. Man, I guess this means I'm going on a date. The tension in here was palpable. So I decided to break the awkward silence. Hey, where are we going? I mean, this isn't actually a real date, is it? It's definitely real. You insisted. I must have looked so dazed that he continued. Don't worry, I'm not messing with you. Anyway, I think you'll like where I'm taking you. I used to think he was incapable of smiling, but turns out he looks even cuter when he does. A drive for cinema? Wow! I'd seen these in old movies, but I had no idea it still existed. So, what's the deal with your sister Chrissy? You mentioned the bet? You know that Chrissy is my sister? Of course, it's not exactly hidden. Besides, I'm friends with Chrissy's boyfriend. So, you know? Yep, there's no secrets between me and Damien. And don't worry, I have his back. So, can you answer my question now? <laughs> I like this different side to Adrian. So before I could stop myself, I told him how the bet wasn't with Chrissy, but with my other sister, Blair. 
And I was catfishing Blair as Damien to protect my family, but it's barely working. Whoa. That's intense. Secrets make things complicated. Life sure would be easier if we could just be ourselves. So, why did you decide to go on a date with me? Don't you think it's weird? <laughs> no, not really. Beats how girls normally ask me out. I arrived home feeling on cloud nine, but then I walked past Chrissy's room and saw her upset. I asked her what's going on. It's Damien. He wants us to go public, but I told him I'm not ready yet. I like having this part of me private, and I don't want Damien to be open to backlash and scrutiny. But he didn't understand and thought I was embarrassed of him. Oh, Chrissy, what a pain. Give him time. I'm sure he'll come around. But the school performance is in a few days. How am I supposed to take the stage in this state? I hated seeing Chrissy so downhearted like this. And I thought about Adrian and what he said during our date about honesty. I don't know much about the pressures of fame. But I do know that your feelings for Damien are real. I don't think love is something that you should hide. Honesty is the best policy. It might be hard at first, but you can get through it together. Now, come to my case, I should also follow my own advice and put an end to my catfishing before it gets out of hand. I tried hard to think of the best way to break this to Blair while we were walking to school the next day. After much hesitation, I pulled her aside before entering school for a talk. Only, before I could get to the main part, Damien walked past and oddly, Blair didn't do so much as to blink. Seeing my confusion, she said, Yesterday, he ignored all of my messages. You're right, I deserve someone better. Anyway, what did you want to tell me? Oh, that, um, my date with Adrian was amazing. It all happened because of you, so thanks. And sorry about Damien. It's okay. That's strange. Did my smitten sister really just give up that easily? But anyway, at least it's all over now. <sighs> and I don't even have to come clean anymore. The day of Chrissy's performance arrived. Me, Adrian, and Damien had backstage access. Actually, I'm here for emotional support as Chrissy is about to tell everyone about her relationship with Damien. This is a surprise for Damien, too. He just thinks we're here to get a better view of Chrissy. <laughs> she slays the performance and the audience adored her. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Actually, today is an extra special day because I have something. But suddenly Blair stormed onto the stage and snatched Chrissy's mic. How about making it even more special with this breaking news? Everyone, she's had a secret boyfriend all this time. She made the poor guy hide in the shadow so she can keep her squeaky clean image. She's lied to you all for years. Is someone like that worthy of your support? Blair ran off as soon as she finished. Boos start coming from the crowd. Many people began commenting on the situation in true TMZ fashion. What is this, 2009 VMA? No way! My Chrissy is taken?! Meanwhile, Chrissy had a panic attack and froze there on the stage. I didn't know what to do. Neither did Damien. Luckily, Adrian kept calm and grabbed the walkie-talkie, connected to Chrissy's in-ear. Chrissy, listen to me. In times like these, there's only one way out, and that's confronting the truth and taking back the narrative. I looked at Adrian and realized something about my own problem. More on that later. For now, let's see how Chrissy handles this. Well, there goes my big reveal. Yes, I'm in a relationship. But I only kept it quiet because I wanted to separate my personal life from my professional one. Being a public figure and a teenager at the same time is not as easy as you might think. So I didn't want to drag my loved one into that life too soon. On reflection, maybe this wasn't the best way to deal with this. I won't hide anything from my fans anymore. And those who truly support me won't judge or speak badly of my decision. Everyone, I want you to meet Damien, my boyfriend. The audience went wild! Aww, this is so cute! but I still had one more problem to deal with. Blair! I look everywhere and finally found her hiding under the bleaches. Blair, it's just me. Please come out. I started to talk about what just happened, but Blair didn't want to hear it. I know everything. You tricked me because you think I'm an idiot. La 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 la. I let her finish her outburst and calm down. Then I apologized and told her the truth. I only did it because I didn't want you going after a boy who's already taken. I know I went about it in a completely wrong way but I just wanted to keep our family together. I love you, and I don't want to be in the middle of your jealousy towards Chrissy anymore. If you just gave her a chance... You could have just been honest with me! This is all because you prefer Chrissy over me, don't you? No, of course not. I just wanted to protect you, and for there to not be any more conflict between you and Chrissy. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Actually, I'm not jealous of Chrissy because she's famous and gorgeous. It's actually because you guys are really close. We used to be that close when our parents divorced, and now, it's like I've been replaced. Blair's honesty touched me in the feels. 
I gave her a big hug, but then realized that we weren't alone. Actually, I'm jealous of you, Blair. You're all Kieran and Eva talks about, and I feel that, even though we're close, I can't compete with her real sister. Oh, so the tension between them wasn't just over a boy. It was actually over me. To me, you're both my real sisters, and I love you dearly. Come on, sisterly cuddle. Oh, by the way, how did you know that I was pretending to be Damien? I overheard your conversation with Chrissy. It didn't take much digging around to figure out it was you texting me, not the real Damien. While we're at it, I find it worrying you were still into him after all those red flags. In future, please let me vet your dates first. You're too easily blinded by good looks. Oh dear, that's why us girls have to stick together, especially when it comes to boys.